baby chum salmon right here at Gold Street Provincial Park. We're at Gold Street Provincial Park, just north of Victoria, and most of you have probably been here for a salmon run. We have 60,000 chum salmon that come and spawn in this river. During that time of year, we have thousands of visitors to the park, and everybody comes out to see what the salmon are doing in the fall. Today, I'm going to tell you what they're doing in the springtime. Behind me is the Gold Stream River. During the springtime, when there's not so many fish and people around, you can really take the time to notice the great habitat that the Gold Stream River provides. We've got the, the shallow pools, the fast-moving riffles, there's fallen trees for shade and, and overhanging vegetation. All of these things help the small fish that are in the river at this time of year. If you remember all those thousands of eggs that were being laid, well, they hatched out into little alevins that live underneath the gravel. And a couple of months ago, those fish began to emerge. Now that it's May, those fish are ready to head out to sea and start their life as an adult. They'll come back in four years to carry on the endless cycle of the chum salmon, but this is just the beginning of their journey. These are baby chum salmon that were born in the Goldstream River last year. They've been in the visitor center for the last few weeks in a tank, and I'm going to let them go today so they can be with the other fish when those fish head out to sea. These little fish will live in the river just for a couple of months. These are chum fry, as I mentioned. Coho fry are a little bit larger when you see them in the river because they stay here for one year. The chum fry leave at the end of May. They spend a little while in the estuary. That's where the river meets the ocean, just outside the front of the nature house here. And in the estuary, the salmon become used to living in salt water. It's a big transition from fresh water to salt water. So they spend a while in the estuary and then they head out to sea. You rarely see chum salmon during their four year four years in the ocean because they're an offshore fish. They go far out. People don't generally catch them when they're sports fishing. You just won't see a lot of them. You look carefully at the little salmon, you can see their par bars. Those are the little lines running down their sides there. The different types of fish have different par bars. I'm going to let these ones go. There they go. Bye, salmon. See you in four years. This little pool on the side of the river was completely cut off from the main river. We spent a lot of time catching fish and letting them go in the springtime at Goldstream. Here, we were able to dig a channel right out of the pond and to the main river so the little salmon can swim out and get their journey down the river. Landlocking is, is a problem that these salmon often face. In the, in the wintertime, when the river is in flood, the salmon can spawn right out on the far sides. But in the springtime, when the rains stop, the small pools get cut off and the little salmon are trapped. Every spring, the park interpreters walk up and down the river, checking for these areas where the salmon have been trapped. We either rescue them in buckets, or we dig these channels to help these little salmon escape. If you look in the water as you walk down this Goldstream River, if you look in the water of these small channels, you will see little tiny salmon. But don't come too late in the year because by June they'll already be gone. Slugs, banana slugs at Goldstream Park. We're at Goldstream Provincial Park, just north of Victoria, and I've got my friend Pat with me today. Pat is a banana slug. When people come to Goldstream, they come here looking for bears and cougars and, and uh, large charismatic megafauna, and they often overlook the smaller animals that call the forest home. Banana slugs are very abundant around here, and they're very important animals. These are the recyclers of the forest. They're the animals that eat all the dead material and turn it into soil and provide great habitat for the other animals that live here. Pat is a fascinating little creature. A banana slug is a mollusk, but this mollusk has no shell. This is the mantle of Pat, and in, a, in another kind of mollusk, a shell would be secreted here. Pat doesn't have a shell. Pat has lots of slime for protection instead. Slime is an interesting thing. If you get slime wet, 
it gets slimier. This is great protection against getting eaten. If you were to put a slug in your mouth, it would be pretty nasty pretty fast. Pat's taking a good look at the camera right now with the uh, extended optic tentacles right here. I'm going to put my finger close to one of these tentacles. Let's see how the eye retracts. Do you see that? Great protection, being able to tuck your eyes in and take them back out again. The second set of tentacles are sensory tentacles. Pat will use those for sniffing the ground or feeling what's ahead so that Pat can move smoothly through the forest. The other reason Pat has slime is for movement. The underneath of the slug, well, if you look carefully, you can see there's a little fringe running along the edge here. It's a skirt. It's called the skirt. And the skirt secretes the slime that slugs move upon. The slime is so powerful and so strong that slugs can climb over broken glass and not get hurt. And watch this. Slugs can hang upside down by their slime and not fall off. It's a great adaptation. If you look carefully along Pat's mantle here, you'll see the breathing hole that Pat has. This hole will be open nice and wide when Pat's moving along like he is right now and will close down again later on when Pat's resting. The reason that we call Pat, Pat, is because well, slugs are neither boys nor girls. They're both at the same time. This is important when you're a slow-moving animal like this slug. If you need to mate and you find another slug after a long, long search and that slug turns out to be the same gender as you, it's going to take you a long time to find another slug. But if you're both a boy and a girl at the same time, it doesn't matter which slug you meet. Procreation can take place. Mollusks like Pat have a very interesting feeding structure. It's called a radula. And what a radula is, it's a sort of a tongue with teeth on it. And Pat will use that radula to lick the food that Pat is after. And that radula will pick up the little pieces of food and carry them into, into Pat's mouth on a long slime trail that runs through Pat's uh, digestive system. The radula is so powerful that the slug can eat wood and leaves, and I've seen them eating paper, and on one occasion when I had a slug on my hand, the slug even ate me. They licked, the slug licked a hole in me, and I actually was bleeding when I took the slug off my hand. So if you can feel the slug licking you, my advice, take the slug off. So if you come to Goldstream Park, come in the morning when it's misty and it's cool, and look for our wonderful friends banana slugs, the recyclers of the forest. We're here at Goldstream Provincial Park and today I wanted to tell you a little bit about one of our most abundant yet least often seen animals. To do this you need to come on down here. The forest floor of Goldstream Provincial Park supports a huge number of animals and the most frequent vertebrate that we find here, it's not a bird, it's not a deer, it's the western red-backed salamander. These animals live down on the ground where it's moist and damp. Being amphibians, they have to stay wet, so their favorite home is underneath rocks and logs like these. Oh, here's one now, the little western red-backed salamander. You can see where it gets its name from. It has a red back. These salamanders are really special animals. There are lots of them at Goldstream Park, but they're really hard to find. They camouflage really well with the forest, and they live underneath of rocks and logs. If you do find one of these salamanders, it's best not to pick them up. The western redback salamander is a lungless salamander. It has no lungs at all, so it has to breathe through its skin. If its skin gets damaged at all, the salamander may not survive. Just the salts and sweat on your hands is enough to damage a salamander. So if you do find one, just look at it in its home and then leave it alone. Some salamanders are, are aquatic and they have to lay their eggs in water. These ones just lay their eggs in damp soil. When the salamanders hatch out of the eggs, they're just like little baby miniature salamanders. So sometimes we find really, really small salamanders in the forest as well. Smaller than my baby fingernail. This is quite a large one. This is a full adult. One of the reasons we have so many salamanders at Goldstream is their prey. Their prey is the banana slug. They like to eat slug eggs. So we see them all over the forest here, because as you know, Goldstream has a lot of banana slugs. The western red-backed salamander. What an amazing little animal, right here at Goldstream Provincial Park. 
We're here at Goldstream Provincial Park, and all around us are ants. Right here we have a nest of what we call red ants. Red ants are quite fierce. These ants can bite, and they also give off formic acid that can uh, deter their predators from coming into the ants' nest. Nobody likes an acid burn. They make an amazing nest. They've chopped up all kinds of grasses from the area, and they've built up their nest, and the nest can become three or four feet high with the ants all living inside of them. It's a pretty interesting place and very busy, the red ant nest. Come on into the estuary. I want to show you another kind of ant that lives out here, the farmer ant. Out here in the estuary, we don't have the red ants. We have sugar ants instead. All over this plant here, this plant is called Angelica, we have little sugar ants making their colonies. The little sugar ants live on here because of a little insect called an aphid. Aphids, as you probably know if you're a gardener, like to suck the juices out of plants, and they can kill plants when they do that. But ants love aphids for doing that. You see, the aphids are like the cows for the ants. The ants can go up to the aphids and stroke their sides, and the aphids will give off this really sweet, sticky liquid that the ants like to eat. So the ants actually farm the aphids. They take them into the ant hill at night, they bring them back out from the ant hill in the morning, and they watch them on the angelica and make sure that no predators come to eat the aphids. For example, on the angelica here, you will never see ladybugs. Ladybugs prey on the uh, aphids, but you will see lots and lots of ants. Further out in the estuary, you'll find angelica growing with salt water near its roots. When you got that happening, you don't have the ants. Ants make their homes in the ground, and they don't like the salt water. That angelica will have ladybugs on it, eating the aphids. But up here, where there's only fresh water in the ground, we have the ants looking after the aphids. Some people ask me, what good are ants? But ants are really important. Ants are like the custodians of the natural world, the garbage men. Well, not really garbage men, because of course, most of the worker ants are female. But what they're doing is they're cleaning up the environment and making it a healthy place for other things to live in. Here's a dead animal out here in the estuary, and see all the ants that were underneath it? Like I said, custodians of the natural world. Ants are truly amazing animals. Next time you're out at Goldstream, you can come on one of our nature walks out to the estuary and have a look at these ants for yourself. It's a pretty interesting place and very busy, the red ant nest. Wild plants at Goldstream Provincial Park. Today we're at Goldstream Provincial Park and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the more unusual flowers and plants that call this park home. If you look down on the ground next to me here, you'll see wild ginger. This is a really unusual plant. Wild ginger grows only in two or three places in Goldstream Park and this plant here is starting to grow and, and to begin to spread out amongst the mossy logs here. It's a very special spot. If you get in really close, you'll see that this plant is in flower. The flowers are what we call cryptic. You can hardly see them at all. They're just tucked down in underneath here, and they're dark brownish red in color, and they have these big, long, hairy, curly bits. They don't smell very nice, so they're probably pollinated by beetles rather than bees. Wild ginger does have a gingery sort of flavor to it, sort of like a lemon ginger, but it's not commonly eaten because it's such a rare plant. Wild ginger, one of my favorites. Big heart-shaped leaves. It's just a beautiful plant. Underneath this magnificent western red cedar tree, we have Pacific water leaf growing on the forest floor, right down here. This plant is very unusual. It also was found only one or two places on Vancouver Island, one of those places being right here in Goldstream Park. And as park use has changed over the years, we've sort of cut back on things like weed whacking on the sides of the trails and making the park a little bit more natural as the, as the years go by. And a result of cutting back on weed whacking, we think, is this wonderful outgrowth of the Pacific water leaf. We're finding this all over the lower valley of Goldstream Park now. In the early spring, it has big 
um, balls of sort of spiky purple flowers that you see growing all over the plant. And we're so excited that this has really taken off at Goldstream. You can recognize this plant by these, these nice looking leaves here. The top one is in three big parts and each of those is in three parts. And the leaves are quite fuzzy if you touch them. It's not a dangerous t um, plant to touch, but like all the plants out here, don't eat them. This plant is called Ocean Spray. It's a really, really common shrub on southern Vancouver Island. It grows all over the roadsides and, and uh, fields and wooded areas. It's a beautiful shrub, makes a great garden plant as well, and some of the nurseries are starting to carry it. And it's a favorite plant of little birds like bush tits, the ones that weave those wonderful nests that look like woolen socks. The Ocean Spray comes out um, sort of in June into July, flowers, and uh, it's just a lovely, lovely plant. The, stems of the tree, if you look, or of the shrub, if you look down here, they grow very, very straight. The native people around here used to call this plant ironwood. That will, the name would translate to ironwood. In fact, they probably still call it that. And the ironwood, it was called that because, um, because the sticks are so straight, they could make tools from the sticks. And then if you fire harden them by roasting them over a fire, it makes the wood really, really hard like iron. So things like digging sticks and other implements could be made from this ironwood, and they wouldn't break very easily. It was a wonderful plant for that. I really love the ocean spray. I just think it's such a decorative, graceful plant all over the place, and it's just grows wild. Here's a plant that everybody should recognize. This is stinging nettle. If you don't know what it is, take a good hard look. It has these typical sort of heart-shaped leaves with the jag jagged edges all along there. This one's already going to seed, so you'll see the little seed pods hanging all the way along the leaf, or, or sorry, along the stem. This plant um, is called stinging nettle because what it has is along the surface of the leaf and the stem are little tiny crystals. You might see them glinting in the light. And the crystals, if you brush against this plant, the crystals will scratch your skin. And then what happens is that the base of the crystal is a little drop of formic acid. So you get a scratch on your skin, and then you get a dab of acid inside the scratch, just to make it really, really itchy. So if you do get stinging nettles, you'll get little bumps turning up all over your hands or your arms or wherever you get stung. The worst thing you can do is scratch it, because what you'll do is drive the um, acid further into your skin, and it'll get itchier and itchier and itchier. What you need to do is just not scratch, and you could even put a little spit on there and, and sort of wash the acid right out of the burn. And that'll stop your stinging nettle sting from being so bad. But it is an amazing plant, the stinging nettle. A lot of butterflies use this to lay their eggs on because, of course, what's going to eat something that's going to sting the inside of their mouth? Animals don't eat a lot of stinging nettle. You'll see slugs and other things like that that will, uh, will chew on the plant. But it's a pretty safe place for butterflies. I really am very fond of stinging nettle, even though it has that sharp edge to it. It is a great plant. If you enjoyed learning about the plants of Goldstream Park today, please come on down to the Nature House. We're open seven days a week and we have walks and talks every single day about things that are happening in Goldstream. Detritus is all the dead stuff that makes up the muck in the bottom of the estuary. And if you look down by my feet, you'll see I'm starting to really stick in some thick, goopy black mud. Right. We're at the Goldstream Provincial Park Estuary. This is a magical place. All around me are the beautiful marsh grasses and plants that can tolerate salt water. The Goldstream River comes into the estuary right down on this side over here. Estuary means a place where a river meets the ocean or the lake. So this is a, a salt water estuary where the ocean and the, and the river are mixing together. Behind me is the ocean and you can just see a few boats at the boathouse right around the corner. And of course our famous eagle's nest is over on the right hand side over here. We're going to walk down into the estuary and take a look down at the detritus that really makes the estuary a special place. Come on with me and I'll show you what I mean. Now we're at one of the saltwater sloughs. This is a place where when the tide starts to come up into the estuary, salt water runs through here first. If we look in the mud, we can see things like salmon bones and seashells all mixed in here. So you can tell that this is ocean water coming through here. And already we're getting into detritus, this wonderful sticky brown mud. Wait till we get down on the mud flats. That's where it gets really good. 
Oh look, here's a killdeer, one of the many shorebirds that come through the Goldstream estuary. It's just running along the mud looking for a snack. We're out here in the muddiest, muddy part of the Goldstream Estuary. This is my favorite place. I'm standing on detritus right now, and detritus is, is all the dead stuff that's rotting and turning into nutritious nutrients to feed the whole ecosystem. If you look down at my feet, you'll see I'm standing in this thick, rich mud. If you come out here when the tide's on its way out, you might get as deep as your knees in mud sometimes. It's wonderful. The tide's just starting to come in now, and so all of the mud flats are being covered up. If we take a little walk over here, we might find some of the little critters that call this area home. Oh, look! Little crabs everywhere in the water. Now those are real detritus feeders. Crabs have all these uh, extra little mouth parts, so they're all pulling in all the mush into their mouth and chewing it up and excreting it out into more mud. It's a wonderful thing. Here's a little tiny one now. These are called shore crabs. These are the same kind of crabs that you find on a rocky beach when you're lifting up rocks. They like to live in mud as well. There you go, little crabby. Have fun in the detritus. The estuary is a beautiful and fragile ecosystem, and it's because of this that we've actually closed the estuary off to the public. It's part of our quiet zone at Goldstream Park, one of the areas where no humans are allowed, just the things that naturally live in the park. But we do lead a guided hikes out through the estuary in the summertime. Just contact us at the Nature House or pick up one of our program guides and look for the program called Mud Between Your Toes. And come on out with one of us to the estuary and find detritus for yourself.